everyone. Welcome to the Grove Church Cultivate Podcast. Charlie Lofton, lead pastor at the Grove Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm glad that you are with us. And we are right now in our Cultivate Podcast are in a, a kind of a mini series where we're kind of working our way through some some theology. And last time, if you if you listened to that, you heard kind of we talked about these different categories of theology, theology proper, Christology, soteriology, pneumatology, all these different categories, but we also spent some time talking about kind of different rankings for different th- theology, like the things that are absolutely essential, even just to be a Christian, things that are foundational, kind of the pieces of theology that really are foundation to good Christian living that Christians should be united around. You can; you, These are the kind of things you grow to understand as you after you become a Christian, but really are foundational to your Christian life. Things that are important where there can be some disagreement amongst Christians are not really kind of the essential things to believe, but they really are important to your day-to-day understanding, but Christians should still be able to be united with one another, even if they disagree, and ultimately the things that are just kind of interesting. So as you can imagine, as we're going to work our way through different um, theological issues that we need to understand as Christians— that we are going to spend the overwhelming majority of our time talking about things that are both essential to becoming a Christian and are foundational to good Christian knowledge and understanding. And so to me, if we're going to kick this thing off, we should really start at the beginning to actually who God is. Who is God really? When you say, I believe in God, what do you mean? It's like, I believe in the Christian God. What does that mean? What do we really mean by that? And we touched on this a little bit in the last one, but I want to bring it up again, that we as Christians, we are theists, T-H-E-I-S-T, theists, uh, which is different, obviously, than an atheist. An atheist is someone who does not believe in God. A theist believes in God. But it's important for us to understand the difference between a theist and a deist, D-E-I-S-T, and where these things come from. Deist comes from the same, essentially, root as as deity, which essentially, really, more than anything, a deist, I believe in a God. And deists typically believe that there is a God that created everything, but he's not particularly interested. And so you can imagine a, a, a person, they make a watch. They really take a lot of care in building this watch, and then they sell it to someone else. And once they sell it to someone else, they're not really keeping track of what happened to that watch. It now belongs to someone else. They're not really interested in it, and they go on to other things, perhaps building other watches. And so that is kind of a summary of a deistic worldview where I believe in a God, and I believe that that God created, but he's not particularly interested in what is going on in my life. He is the God of this universe and multiple universes, who knows what, and he's so big, and he does not care that I flipped off somebody in traffic today. Like, it's just, how? why would that God care? God, That God does not care that I was mean to my wife. That God does not care that I fed someone who was hungry today. That God just doesn't simply care. He doesn't notice or he doesn't care. So that is a deistic world worldview and believe in I believe in a God, but to be a Christian, we are theists. I believe, which really at at its core, I believe, we believe, Christians believe, you need to believe in a God that is both active and personal. Active and personal. So he is active in the sense that he still has some influence over the ins and outs of the way that the world works right now. You see this sometime in scripture where it talks about how that, that he is holding the universe together. He's holding the world together. We, you know, the, the use of miracles is, is, it, is you know, evidence of an active God. The answering of prayer, even the listening to prayer, that God is doing things, that, you, that, that we believe that this God not only has the potential to act in our world, but in fact, does it. Now, that may be to degrees of that when we talk about, when you talk about free will and predestination, how much control does God have? But at a minimum for us to be Christians, for us to be theistic Christians, we believe that God does not simply have the potential to act in our world, but does act in our world. And in addition to being active, he is also personal. He knows and cares about you individually. He is not just a God that is created this universe. He wants to keep it together. He wants it to keep working right. He's interested. He doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want 
the planets to collide, but he doesn't really notice or care that I ignored my kids yesterday or, you know, I, 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 I helped an older lady, you know, carry her groceries to her car. He's, he's, he's not, he's not personal. Like he, he knows me and is interested in me. He is sad. If I am sad, he is happy when I am happy. I have a personal relationship with God. And so he is not just a macro interested God, active God, but he is at a very micro level with each individual person is a personal God. So when we talk about we believe in God, capital G God, at a minimum, we need to start there, a theistic God who is both personal and active. And so as we go to the Bible and we begin to learn and discover and read and understand more and more about who this God is, um, the the historical Christian position is that we would describe God as 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 a Trinity or a triune T R I U N E a triune God. We believe in a Trinity. While you will not find that word Trinity anywhere in the Scripture, it is a word that was created to describe the phenomenon of how God describes himself and how he is talked about all throughout the scripture. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a definition of Trinity. And if you don't write this down or you're not really, you know, or you would, I'd like to come back to it later. I'm not, I'm not getting this from some fancy place. I didn't make this up on my own. This is just straight out of the Wikipedia, which has a pretty good article on it and has essentially the very standard orthodox definition of what Trinity mean that has been around for thousands of years. And so in Christian, I'll just registrate, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds that God is one God and exists in the form of three co-eternal, and here's your fancy word, fancier word, consubstantial persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three persons are distinct yet are of one substance, essence, or nature. So there's a lot to try to understand there. And I I totally get that. And this is a, a deep and complex and complicated issue. And so I want you though, I want you though, like as, as we're kind of grappling with both the essential nature of theology and kind of these foundational things, We're kind of on the line here. Everything I said here about him being a theistic God is absolutely essential to our understanding of being a Christian and our ability to understand the nature of God as Trinity, I believe is incredibly foundational to us being able to understand who God is and how he interacts with us and what he has done. And so I think it is important for us to understand this. And so the first part of this is when, you know, in in this definition is that we believe in one God. Even as we talk about that the Father is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, the natural thing to say, okay, we believe in three different gods. It is absolutely essential that we understand that we believe in one unified God, not, not three gods, one God. And one of the most important uh, passages in the Old Testament it was this kind of a, like a, a foundational, it was there, it was their key verse, Deuteronomy 6, 4. And we'll add five to it too, because they really go together. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this was a very important battle cry for them because they lived, I mean, they had just come out of Egypt where, you know, when they thought of God, they thought about multiple deities, you know, sun god and you know sky god these kinds of things like all of these different types of gods that rule over different things we believe that the lord our god the lord is one that's called monotheism the belief in one god only it's not that these other god exists and this one rules over them there is only one god this was absolutely essential to them it was very a novel idea for them it was revealed to them by god himself in a world where there was a lot of polytheism, multiple gods, a lot of animism, where there's just a lot of worship of, of creation, uh, this was a revelation from God to the Jewish people that God is a singular God. 
So God is not in some sort of pantheon of gods where there's the Christian God, the Jewish God, the the Muslim God, the Buddhist God, all the Hindu gods, the Egyptian gods, the Norse gods. It's not, it's not that there's a pantheon and that this God is the king of those gods. There is only one capital G God and that the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. And so essentially what it's saying is there is only one God and he gets all of your worship and devotion. And so very early on in the scriptures, we understand that there is only one God. But even if you back it up to the creation story in Genesis chapter one, it'll talk about how God created the heaven and the earth. But even there, in, in the first couple of verses, it talks about how the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the water. We see the presence of the Holy Spirit in creation. And we'll see later in Colossians, the active role that Jesus played. And we see that all three of them are playing an active role in the creation of the universe. And even in this, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, it really does. It has more of a unified sense. It's, it's like this, it is almost like, the hints of majestic plurality in there. There is only one God, but it really has such a strong emphasis on unity that even that kind of hints at this idea of the Trinity. And so I don't have to find any verses to to say, hey, we believe in in God. There's only one God. And God, who who we would refer to as God the Father, he's God. I mean, like, That's just kind of, that's kind of default. Like you read through the Old Testament and we're learning about who God the Father is. And then in the Gospels, starting in Matthew, we learn about this guy, Jesus. And he refers to himself various times as the son of God. He refers to himself as the son of man. He talks about how his father sent him and him referring to his father versus our father. Okay, well, that's kind of weird. And referring to yourself as the son of God, that's kind of different. And we begin to see Jesus thinking and talking about himself very differently. And one of the most critical passages where Jesus is talking about who he is, is in John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, he is just going back and forth with... um, with these people who are upset with him and these Jewish people who don't really get into or really into what he's saying. They think he is pushing the limits about what a rabbi, what a teacher should be saying. And he's after them about how they don't really represent Abraham very well. And so they are just going back and forth. And it's like, and in verse 53 of John chapter eight, are you greater than Abraham? He died. And so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus, like, if I glorify myself, that doesn't mean anything. My father, whom you claim is your God, I mean, there's a lot of salt right there, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I didn't, I would be a liar like you. I mean, this is just, this is, uh, this is just incredible. But I do know him and obey his word. And your father, Abraham, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. So here we've got Jesus saying, I was with Abraham when we kind of came up with this idea for me to come here and he was really fired up about it, which is a pretty incredible thing to say for a guy who's only in his early thirties. And, and they, obviously they catch on to this verse 57. You are not yet 50 years old. They said to him, and you have seen Abraham in verse 58. Very truly. I tell you, Jesus answered before Abraham was born. I am at this. They picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself. And so what he says to that is before, it's not just that I knew Abraham. I'm telling you that before Abraham was around, I was around. But even more than that, he doesn't say before Abraham was born, I was born or I was created. He says before Abraham was born, I am present tense, which is also a throwback to the name that God, the father gives himself in Exodus when talking to Moses at the burning bush. It seems to be very, very clear that what Jesus is saying here is not only did I exist before Abraham, but I eternally existed and I am giving to myself the title and name that God the Father gave to Moses back in Exodus. And if there's any confusion, oh man, Charlie, I don't know if that's exactly what that means. I mean, the people he said it to, they knew what he meant because they immediately picked up a rock. 
and which was to say, this guy is saying that he is God. And as much as Jesus is taunting them and arguing with them in this passage, he is never misleading them. He says, I'm not a liar. He's not trying to deceive them. He's not trying to confuse them. He's trying to tell them who he is. And in so doing, makes a very clear and compelling statement to him being God and connects himself with God the Father of the Old Testament. And the author of John, who heard Jesus say all of these things, starts off in John chapter 1. His reflection on what it is that he has learned about this Jesus says this about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John, one of his disciples who heard all of this, heard all the things that Jesus said in his reflection and his intro to this book, makes the very bold declaration that Jesus, this Jesus who I'm writing about, is in fact God. So already now we've got that God, there is God the Father that Jesus talks to, prays to, considers to be different than him, but he is also connecting himself to, hey, I also am God. And so now we've either got a very confusing nature of God or we've got two gods, but we already know very clearly that the Bible teaches that there is only one God. And then you add to that the, about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being God. And what we have there, um, there's, there's less powerful, clear examples of this. I mean, the teaching that Jesus gives about himself, about who he is, makes it undeniable. But um, with, with the Holy Spirit, I, w- I would say, I mean, not a, we, we learn a lot about the Holy Spirit. It talks about, you know, when, you know, Paul's talking about you, you being the temple of God, you are the temple of God. So what is the temple of God? That is a place where God dwells. And why are you the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So the Holy, if you are, you are a temple of God, we know that because God lives in you. How do we know that God lives in you? You, we know that God lives in you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But also in Acts chapter 5, we've got this story. It's Ananias and Sapphira, these two people. They're selling land and everybody's selling land and giving the money to the apostles. And they do it, but they don't give all the money to the apostles and lie to the apostles about, about that. They say that they do, but they don't. They only give a portion of the money. And, and Peter is really frustrated with them, really upset with them. And ultimately they both die as a result of the sin. And the way that it's kind of categorized is Peter says, like, you think you're lying to people. You are not lying to people. You are lying to the Holy Spirit. You're not lying to me. You're lying to God. And so he references their lie, that their lie is to the Holy Spirit. And that lie to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. So we've got, we've got, you know, this, this reference to the temple of God, that, that, is, that is God in you, but we're talking about the Holy Spirit. God the Father doesn't live in you. Jesus doesn't live in you. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to live in you, and that makes you the temple of God because God's presence is now inside of you. And we've got Peter equating lying to the Holy Spirit to lying to God. That is essentially the same thing. And so we have the Holy Spirit as God, and the Holy Spirit, again, has all the attributes of God is is Every is a lot of is everywhere at once, knows everything, knows things only God can know, goes places only God can go. Again, is a part of the creation of the universe, not a created part of the universe. And so he demonstrates the attributes of God, talk about the temple of God, lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. Peter equates them. So now what we have is we've got three different persons. And I think it's important at this point for us to talk about what a person is. When we say person, we're talking about a personality, something that makes you dis- a distinctive person. So we're not talking about being a human. We're talking about the things that make you a person. The difference between, I, I would say like the easiest thing to say, the most non-controversial thing that I could say is like the thing that makes people different from say bugs. I mean, bugs, they can act, they can move, they can do things. They don't have personality. They don't have wills. They, they, they run on instinct. Really what I want to say, and this is the controversial thing, it's the thing, that thing that makes people different than dogs. And then if I said next, you know, because we have personality, like my dog has a personality, blah, 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 blah. okay, wait, wait, wait. but whatever it is that the distinction between people and dogs, you know, not relying on instinct, you know, the self-awareness 
the 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 awareness of distinction, personality, will, choice, those kinds of things. However you would describe that, the thing that makes me distinct from another person and the thing that makes people distinct from inanimate objects, from other animals, that is what makes us, that's what makes someone a person. And in that sense, God is a person. He has a will. He has emotions. He has a personality. And what we're discovering now is that there are three different persons that the Bible all declare to be God, but we also know that there is only one God, and that God is one. There is a unified one God. And so now we put this together, and we've got part of the definition, part of this definition of of Trinity, that, that, that God is one God and exists in the form of three persons. And these... Um, these words that were used, these kind of adjectives, co-eternal means they have always been. They were not created. One God did not create. One person of the Trinity did not create another. They have all co-eternally exist and consubstantial. They they are the same. They are the same in their substance, in their essence, in the nature of who they are. They are the same, even though they are distinct persons. So we've got three persons one God. And at this point, most people's minds are just kind of blown and they, and they just kind of want to stop. I'm going to add one little more piece to this and I'm going to try to maybe just give you a little bit of, a little bit more clarity to it. At the baptism of Jesus, when Jesus is getting baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. And we hear the voice of God, the father coming from heaven saying, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So we see in one moment the presence of all three distinct persons at the same time. And so they they are one person. They are three persons and they are distinct. They are different from one another. And so to kind of help you understand this, I want you to like, because most people will try to categorize this and will typically go to one of two historical heresies in Christianity. One is polytheism. Well, bro, you can spin it however you want, but that just sounds like there's three gods. There's not three gods. There is only one God, right? That it, whatever, whatever it is you're thinking. If you're thinking there are three gods, then you've taken the distinctiveness of the persons too far. There are not three gods. There's just one God. Okay, it's not that. Well, some people are like, well, I mean, well, then it's probably like this. You know, it's just like one God and he kind of, you know, has three different costumes or three different roles. And so the way you could like, analogy, hey, I'm Charlie. I'm only one Charlie, but I'm Charlie the dad, Charlie the the husband, and Charlie the mediocre podcaster, right? And so it's like those. Are, it's just one Charlie, but three different things. And that historically has been called modalism, M O D A L I S M, modalism. And modalism is an historical heresy as well, where We believe in one God that's kind of got different masks, puts on different costumes, plays different roles. And that is taking the unity, the oneness of God too far. So somewhere between those two heresies is what historical Orthodox theology tells us about the Trinity. And at this point, people say, I want you, I wish you could explain more. I wish we would, you would say more, tell me, tell me more. And honestly, I think at this point, I've always given this advice. At this point, I feel like it's best to say less because the more I try to explain it, and maybe you've heard this in Sunday school or other places growing up, you know, God's kind of like water. It exists in three things. It's like, it's like ice and, and water and steam, or it's like an egg. There's the yolk and the shell. And you're like, the more, once you try to describe it, you're going to end up either being a modalist or a polytheist. But the reality of it is, that definition, that's it. And the more, and, and I want to reflect on it, but I don't, the more I try to describe it, the more trouble I'm going to get into. And most people are like, well, not, that just does not make sense. You cannot have three persons and one God. You just can't. And I would like to leave you with this. If you told me that the nature of who God actually is was a, I was a, I was going to be able to completely and totally comprehend that. I would tell you whatever you're telling me to believe in is not God. There should be some things about the nature of who God is that should be un, incomprehensible to the mind of a person. 
And so I would imagine this is not the least complicated aspect of the very nature of what an eternal God is like. And we could talk about some of those, but we would clearly be at some point be dabbling into the interesting. And right now at this point, we want to keep it at the foundational. But I, I, I think to me, the fact that I don't understand it and you're struggling to understand it, I think that is even more evidence of, of just, guys, this is who God is. I mean, if, if I could completely describe everything about God, really what I will have described is an ideal person, which is not what he is. He's not an ideal human. He is God. And something, things about his nature are not going to make sense to me. So that's a, that's, you know, a few minutes there on the Trinity. It's kind of these, these critical pieces of what we believe. Uh, again, it's really important for us to begin to think theologically, to understand theology, understand who God is, to kind of have this real foundation of knowledge. So I just encourage you to keep joining us on this journey as we keep talking about different aspects of, of who God is, systematic theology, the things that are important for us to believe. And again, we would love for you to join us sometime at the Grove Church. You can find us at thegrovechurch.org slash connect. You can find out everything that you need to know about the church and how you could join us on a Sunday morning if you're local. And if you're not, we'd love to see you online. You can join us. We're streaming our services every Sunday. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. And we would love to see you in some way. So again, thanks for joining us and have a great day.